Hello everyone and welcome to today's class on procurement. Now procurement is another word for buying. And so in the business world, procurement is a process for buying the materials and services needed for the company to conduct its business. So pretty much in every business, there is a procurement function. And this function deals with buying any material, any service required for production. Um, if you're in the services business, um, such as, you know, maybe you own a hair salon, you will still need to buy products such as shampoo and conditioner. And so um, even in the services industry, procurement is necessary. So in today's class, we're going to be discussing a couple of very interesting questions. Um, the first one is, is this procurement function, is it really important? Is it something that businesses should really be worried about? The second question that we will be uh, looking at is whether or not procurement of all goods should be done in the exact same way. We will be looking at how sourcing or buying of goods should ideally be done. We will also try to understand how companies deal with price volatility when they are in the market to buy goods. We'll also be learning when outsourcing should be done. And finally, we will be learning a little bit about what procurement social responsibility is and whether companies should be worried about it. So we have quite a long agenda for this class um, and I will dive right into the first question, why worry about this function called procurement? Is it really that important? If we look historically, and we look at you know, a time frame from 1950 till 2010, we can see a general trend where the cost of materials and services in companies has been increasing and the cost of wages and overhead has been decreasing. So this definitely gives us a hint that procurement is important because the buying of materials has become a bigger share of the total costs of a company. Furthermore, there is a very important reason why procurement is extremely important for companies, which is the leverage. And let me explain to you what the leverage is all about. On this slide, um, you can see it's an income statement. And, um, you know, just to start off with, there's a baseline, right? And so we can see uh, the baseline is going to be the figures which we will compare um, all other um, you know forecasts with. So if we look at the baseline, the revenue is 1,000 million, materials 390 million, labor and overheads 275 million, and when you take the revenue and you subtract the materials and services and labor and overhead, you get a gross margin of 335 million. And when you subtract operating expenses of 200 million, you end up with a net income of 135 million. Now something very interesting happens if, for example, we keep everything the same, but somehow um, the the cost of materials and services is decreased by 5%, this 5% over here. So if we decrease the materials and services cost by 5% and we keep everything else the same, what we'll notice is that the net income actually increases by 14%. So a decrease in materials and services of 5% is helping the net profit increase by 
14%. And therefore, there is an element called, this is a leverage. So you're in, you're, but just by changing, you know, one element, you're seeing a big swing and improvement in net profits. All right, let's take another example. In this example, the net, sorry, the cost of materials and services is decreased by 10%. So instead of 390 million, the cost of materials and services is decreased to 351 million. Everything else remains the same, but what you'll see is when you decrease the cost of materials and services by 10%, the net income increases by 29%. Similarly, if we decrease the cost of materials and services by 15%, we will see an increase in net income of 43%. And so, uh, you know, as mentioned in the Fortune magazine in 1995, if a company is actually looking to improve its profits, one of the first things they should try to do is reduce the materials and services costs. So that being said, um, it's, you know, we've definitely answered the first question. Uh, procurement is an extremely important function and uh, we, we've explored the reasons as to why. Now, a couple of things um, needs, need to be mentioned uh, regarding procurement. So um, here in this photo, you can actually see an iceberg. And so you can see the tip of the iceberg above the water but uh, what's hidden under the water is this huge, huge um, iceberg. And so the idea, this is symbolic. And so the point is that many times when we go out into the market, uh, we see the price of a good and we decide whether or not we want to buy it based on the price. But that should not be the only element when we are making our decision. We should look at the total cost of the good. And we should basically be um, also considering other elements such as delivery, defects, handling, training of use of the product or service, um, the service that's offered if you're buying a product, handling, are there any social responsibility risks involved if you purchase the good, financial stability of the company who you are buying from, inspection of the goods. I mean, there's so many other aspects that need to be taken in consideration. So according to the price iceberg concept, uh, while we tend to only see the price paid upfront, there are many other aspects that determine the total cost to our business of making the purchase. Price of the component is only part of the total cost of the product. Okay, so um, after you know answering the first question, I'm now going to start exploring the second question with you. And the second question is, should procurement of all goods be handled the same way? Generally speaking, if, if there is a business, could be a computer business, could be a fast food business, could be any business, um, just I've given two examples on this slide, but it could be any business. What some of the important questions that the procurement department needs to understand is, um, let's say you have a computer business, is how many do we buy? How many of various parts do we buy? Um, how much does each part cost? How unique is the part? And how many suppliers are in the market that make the part? And so it's very important to ask all of these questions. And we will understand why in the future slides. To start off with, when you are trying to evaluate the goods that your company is purchasing, one of the first things you really want to understand is if the goods are part of a simple market or a complex market. In a simple market, the risk is low for the company. And the reason is that 
for that particular good, there are many, many suppliers in the market. In a simple market, there is generally excess capacity of the product that you are wanting to procure. The goods are standard. They aren't very specific. They aren't very unique. They are standard goods that you are looking to purchase. And there are many substitutes, possible substitutes of the product. And so therefore the goods, it's a low risk situation in a simple market. If you, you know, there are so many substitutes for all the reasons I explained, it, that's a simple market. Now, if the, if, if the good is part of a complex market, then there is a high risk for you, the company that is purchasing. A complex market is a market where there are very few suppliers. There is restricted capacity. So there are few suppliers and each of those suppliers are not making a lot of the product that you're interested in buying. The product that you want to buy has a very unique specification. It's not easily available. It's very unique. Maybe you want something customized and there are no substitutes in the market. So immediately when you are um, thinking of procurement, one of the first uh, categorizations you should be considering is, is the product part of a simple market or complex market? And that will help you determine whether it's a low risk item or a high risk purchase, right? High risk, sorry, a low risk purchase or a high risk purchase. So that, we just discussed, everything we just discussed was regarding the supply risk, right? And, you know, again, um, in these slides, um, basically this, um, this, this chart over here, this graph over here is called a value risk map. So in the previous slide, we discussed the supply risk. Another thing that you really want to um, categorize goods that you purchase um, on is how much money you spend on buying. Um, do you spend a lot of money or little money? And when you start plotting goods on this chart over here and identify whether it's part of a simple market or complex market and how much money you're spending, very little or a lot, then what you'll see is, and you start plotting them over here, you'll see that each of the goods that you are purchasing actually falls in one of these four quadrants. And depending on which quadrant it falls in, you should have a separate procurement strategy. And you should understand the advantages and disadvantages of being in any one of these categories. I will explain you each one of these categories in the next few slides. The first category is this one, the tactical category. And if you fall in the tact, if goods fall in the tactical category, there is, they, you, the company is not spending a lot of money and the goods are available in a simple market. So there's a low risk involved in the purchasing of the goods, in the procurement of the goods, and the company is not spending a lot of money on them. So um, here the main idea um, is that you should really be focused on reducing the number of times you have to buy the goods, your transaction costs, your main objective should be to reduce the number of times that you're having to go to the market to buy the goods. Um, you should be communicating digitally with the suppliers. Um, and also it may be beneficial to use vendor managed inventory where the supplier constantly keeps an eye on your inventory levels. And if the inventory starts getting low, the supplier automatically replenishes the inventory. So um, these are the you know, small ticket items easily available in the market. Not really something that companies need, really need to worry too much about. 
The next category of goods that I will be discussing with you is called the leverage buy category. And in this category of goods, um, you're spending a lot of money on buying these goods, but it's you're operating in a simple market. So the goods are part of a simple market, therefore the risk is low, but you're spending a lot of money on them. So here, um, what the the strategy? If the uh, if your your the goods you're purchasing, if they're falling in this category, the strategy you should be using is number one: conduct auctions. Go out in the market and actually let suppliers know that you are in the market to buy uh, to procure a certain good and find out. Let uh, suppliers bid and go for the lowest bid. Also, you want to reduce your total landed cost, which means the total cost, including transportation. So you want to look for the solution where you have minimized your total landed costs. You also want to keep checking if there are any new suppliers that enter the market and you want to um, you know, discuss whether you can get better rates uh, with the new suppliers. Another thing that you should do if you are purchasing goods that fall in this category is that you should do volume le leveraging. And what volume leveraging means is that you want to try to buy in bulk and get discounts from your um, suppliers. So maybe, you know, within your company, you can go across various divisions and try and consolidate um, order, uh, get a big order and um, get a discount. You can also join a horizontal consortium, and this basically means you can reach out to your non-competitive firms, find out if they need the same goods, make a, consolidate all your requirements, go to the market, and um, again, negotiate good rates with the supplier and get a discount. Your main strategy in this segment should be continuity. You wanna make sure that um, you, know, you have a continuous flow of goods, um, and that there's no shortage in your company. The next category of goods that I'd like to talk to you about are, is, are the goods that fall in the critical buy. These are goods that the company spends very little money on, but they are part of a complex market. Usually these are goods that you're, you, have, for example, maybe you want customized design tools, capital equipment, specialty items, specialty support services. Again, we're looking at more of, you know, purchase of customized goods. And so these goods, uh, because they're customized, very specific, um, you're working and you're dealing with a complex market and the risk is high. If you are falling in this category, it could be a little bit problematic for your company. And what is advised is that you try to simplify your requirements, go for standardized items, try to um, get out of buying these customized goods, uh, decrease your, your, the variety perhaps of the goods that you are purchasing and make long-term contracts. Um, try and work with companies and, and and make long-term contracts um, so that you know you don't run into any shortages for the goods that you would like to purchase. Keep some safety stock, some buffer stock of the goods. Look for substitutes and also look for other suppliers. So you definitely, um, you know, this is a little bit of an uncomfortable category to be in because companies may um, run into shortages or difficult situations with suppliers. So very important to look for alternate substitutes um, and alternate suppliers. The last category is the strategic category. And if your goods uh, that you are procuring fall into the strategic category, these are goods that are very, you know, the company is spending a lot of money to buy them and they're also part of a complex market. But these goods are essential for the firm because they give your firm a competitive edge. And so it's well worth it for your company to invest in these strategic goods. If 
goods that fall in this category, um, your aim should be, your strategy should be to establish long-term partnerships and relationships with your suppliers for, of these goods. Um, you want to work on um, you know, just even doing joint product development with your suppliers. You want to come up with innovative cooperation. And you also want to look for alternate suppliers and substitute products because, again, you're working in a complex market, which is a very high risk situation. Some companies even go so far as to do vertical integration. And so, for example, um, they will start entering the business of uh, the supplier. So, for example, if I have a restaurant and I'm constantly going and buying fresh vegetables on a daily basis, if I do vertical integration, then I would consider actually making a farm and growing veggies, vegetables, and um, that would be vertical integration. So to minimize risk, some companies actually decide to go and do vertical integration. This slide basically um, is a synopsis or a summary of everything that I have described to you um, so far uh, uh, about what you know, the strategies should be in each of these quadrants. Finally, one important thing to mention here is that for those goods that fall into the critical quadrant where the company is spending a low amount of money but um, the risk is very high, it makes a lot of sense to uh, try and shift those products in one of the other three categories. And um, you know, the whole idea is if you, either you try to standardize your requirements and reduce your requirements, uh, reduce, and if you want to keep, you know, these, keep spending a very little amount of money on these goods makes sense to try and shift those goods from critical goods to tactical goods by you know finding more suppliers or changing the engineering specifications um, on the other hand if you want to try and move them into the leverage category you can lower the complexity and consolidate the buy and partners with and partner with other firms that have the same requirement to increase volume um, also, you may consider taking these critical goods and trying to figure out a way to make them a strategic advantage for you. And if you decide to do that, then you can actually um, consider spending more money on them and partnering perhaps with some other suppliers. So that brings me to the end of the second question. Um, and we've definitely understood that the procurement of all goods should not be handled the same way. The procurement of goods really should be handled according to the risk that they have and the amount that a company is spending. And you can figure out what strategy you should have for um, the procurement of your goods based on value and risk mapping. The next question that we will be addressing is, how sourcing or procurement should actually be done? What are the steps that a company should follow um, to do their procurement? So the first step is that firms should do an internal assessment of exactly what is required and who are the key constituents, meaning who are the main parties who are demanding the goods? Um, it's very important to validate and get a clear and concise understanding of exactly what needs to be procured. The next step is a market under, uh, assessment. And here um, it's, it's important to really understand who the potential suppliers of the goods are in the market and also understand what competitors are doing. The third step is to collect supplier information. And while you're collecting supplier information, you also want to start figuring out what your key criteria will be to assess which supplier you would like to eventually work with, and also to understand about approximately how much each supplier will be asking for. 
Next, you need to develop a very robust um, subsourcing strategy. And this is basically outlining all the specifications that you will be considering uh, when figuring out which supplier you will finally be choosing. So almost like a checklist that you go down um, and you can read each supplier on. So the specifications are very important. The next phase is the bidding process. And in this phase, um, your company, actually, if you are in the market to procure something, needs to develop a request for proposal, also known as RFPs. And these RFPs are detailed document that outline exactly all the information that is needed from the suppliers um, interested uh, whom you are interested in working with. And um, these RFPs are then sent out to uh, parties. Many times RFPs are actually put in newspapers or in public publications, you know, industry publications. And, um, and once the suppliers actually see the RFP, they send in uh, uh, an answer to the RFP to the firm. And uh, based on those answers to the RFP, the suppliers are shortlisted. In the next step, once the suppliers are shortlisted, um, the process of negotiation and final selection begins. And suppliers are asked to come into the company, make presentations, and uh, finally, uh, you know, negotiation is done with the top contenders. And um, finally, the supplier is chosen and selected. The last phase is also a very important phase. This is the contract in uh, implementation. And um, here in the contract, you want to include the implementation plan, the communication plan, how you will be measuring the, um, how well the supplier is doing, um, the service levels they're providing, and also an audit plan. The feedback loop is basically, you know, partially mentioned in that I just mentioned um, in the contract. But um, what's very important to remember is that uh, once the contract is made with the supplier, you need to have a system where you regularly measure and report um, how well the supplier is doing, um, how good their service is, how good their products are. Um, if you have any issues or complaints, those need to be um, captured and um, they need to be communicated to the supplier and the supplier needs to uh, fix those uh, problems. And only once uh, this feedback loop is correctly uh, handled, then the contract is renewed. And um, this is very important. This is a very important part of the sourcing process and procedure. Um, so this is, you know, everything, a pictorial representation of everything that I just explained. There are seven key steps and then additionally a feedback loop. And so, um, you know, uh, if, if it all goes well, uh, the contract goes well if, and the feedback loop is positive, then, you know, um, the contract is renewed. All right, something, a useful tool when evaluating suppliers um, is this kind of a supplier evaluation web. And um, on this, you can see that cost is not the only aspect that is being considered when evaluating suppliers. So definitely cost competitiveness is one of the um, key metrics, but there are many others. For example, there's quality, quality of goods um, being offered, logistics improvement, um, you know, are, how, what is their supply chain management like? How responsive is the company? If there's any complaints, how quickly will they address them? The level of innovation that the suppliers have, sustainability practices, um, you know, do, do they, are their factories in good shape? Uh, you know, are, do they have any child labor? Hopefully not, um, those kind of issues. Technology and systems, they should be having very good technology and systems and good administration. So a well-functioning company. And so if, if you are, uh, you know, one way is to actually rank companies. Another way is to actually rate them and put them 
put the rankings or ratings on this kind of a evaluation web. And here you can actually, it's sometimes easier to have a pictorial representation because you can actually see, you know, for example, on sustainability one, uh, this company, the blue company seems to be um, behind, but in uh, logistics improvement, they're far ahead. So you can, you know, have a very, inf make a very informed decision sometimes when you put things out in, in a pictorial format such as this. One thing that I had mentioned in the price iceberg um, discussion that we had earlier in this class is that it's very, you, you need to be careful not to just um, buy goods based on the price. You should actually be looking at the value beyond the purchase price. Um, for example, many times people buy something cheap, but it breaks down. And so um, if, it, if it's constantly breaking down, then that's not necessarily a good purchase. And, and let's say, um, you know, there's no service that's being offered by the company because the company says, look, we offered you something really cheap. Now you're on your own. Versus you buy something, if, there, if there's, maybe you pay a little bit extra, but if you ever run into any problem, the company is very quick to offer you service, um, offer you any sort of additional help that you may need. And so that's why, you know, it's, it's important to sort of do value-based sourcing, look beyond the purchase price. Some of the things that, you know, strategic questions that people many times ask is, look, if we buy this good from this supplier, will it increase or decrease our overall risk? You definitely want to be looking at a situation where your overall risk is reduced. Um, you want to figure out if you buy a certain good from a supplier, will this, you know, good quality good give your company a competitive edge? If you're spending a little bit extra, will it actually give your company a competitive edge? If so, maybe it's worth it. Um, will it really help you maybe expand your portfolio in a certain way? Um, maybe you can increase your offering, do something different uh, because the goods are, you know, the, the goods that you're procuring are really good quality. And so um, these are some of the questions that you need to really be thinking about um, when you're thinking about doing value-based sourcing. In general, when companies are buying, uh, you know, small ticket items, low value, low risk products, they have a more transactional focus. And so if it's a very small product, barely they're gonna use it, it's a very low cost product. Um, companies generally tend to have a transactional uh, transaction focus. Um, they really don't spend a lot of time with communication. They really don't need a contract or they, and they really don't get very involved with the supplier. But if the goods are high value and high risk products um, and they're working in a complex supply chain market, then generally speaking, companies um, have a more collaborative or collaboration focus with suppliers. And so they end up communicating a lot more with suppliers. They try to enter long-term contracts and they try to have a lot more supplier um, involvement. All right, now, the next question that we will be focusing on is how should companies handle price volatility when purchasing? Now, many times companies need to buy special uh, procure goods that have a very volatile pricing. And so, um, for example, um, you know, a company may need to buy fuel or uh, certain commodities. And um, if you look at the price of these, whether it's fuel, um, for example, the price goes up and down quite regularly. It's very volatile. And so it's, it's really very difficult for companies because um, they need to buy this product. And when the price of a key ingredient such as fuel is going up and down so much, it impacts their productivity and their pricing. 
And so they really want to reduce the risk of this volatile pricing of uh, volatile pricing. And there are two basic methods to do this. The first one is hedging. And you can do uh, financial hedging or physical hedging. And I will explain uh, both of those to you. And the second method to really reduce volatile uh, pricing is, and to deal with it is, that a company can separate their fixed and variable costs. And I will explain both of these methods to you. All right, so let's talk about what financial hedging is. So let's say again, you um, want to buy fuel um, and the price is going you know, up and down all over the place. One thing that you can do is that you can talk to your um, supplier and negotiate a long-term contract at a fixed price in the in the companies in your in your preferred currency so let's say um you know you would like to have a long-term contract for fuel at a set price um in dollars so you can just say look this is it let's let's enter a hedging um uh, let's enter a simple hedge and let's lock into a long-term break and no matter what happens in the market um i'll always buy from you always buy from you at, a, at a, this rate, right? Till the contract is intact. So that's an example of a simple hedge. Um, a next, another type of financial hedging is a forward contract. And in a forward contract, you buy or sell the commodity or a related one for future delivery on a given date at a given price. So um, again, let's say you need a shipment of fuel um, six months from now, you enter a forward contract and you say, look, I will buy um, X amount of fuel six months from now at a given price that we negotiate right now. And so this is an example of a financial hedge um, forward contract. The third um, type of financial hedging is called an option. And an option, it could be a call or a put option. And this gives you the right to buy or sell at a certain price at a future, at a certain future date. So again, this is, you can choose to actually um, go for the call option and actually um, materialize the uh, call option or you can choose not to, depending on what's happening in the market. So let's say, um, you know, I have taken a call option to buy something at a certain um, price at a certain date, and I realize that, you know what, um, in the market is offering a lower rate, then I will not exercise my call option. I will choose to forego it. Um, on the other hand, if the price is a lot higher, then I will exercise my call option. Put option is the option to sell at a certain uh, price at a certain future date. Again, I don't need you to necessarily become subject matter experts in these financial hedging um, instruments, but I do need you to understand um, that they exist and that they can help you deal with volatile pricing. There is a um, little bit of a downside to doing this kind of financial hedging, and that is that buying these options actually costs money. And uh, the other thing is these are not permanent solutions. They actually expire at a certain date. And if you don't, if you don't exercise these, um, you know, they become pretty much worthless. Generally speaking, companies like to use options many times, almost like insurance. So they pay a little bit of money, but they feel that it's well worth it because if things go really south or there's a huge amount of volatility, then it will save them a lot of money. And so um, it, uh, that's why companies actually many times go for buying such um, financial options. Uh, one thing to also remember is that Contracts are financial hedging options are actually considered as 
assets on a company's balance sheet. Okay, so, um, you know, we've just discussed financial hedging. Now I'm going to tell you just a little bit about physical hedging. And um, just to give you an example, I'll sort of, first of all, let me just tell you what physical hedging is. It's basically creating conditions in which fluctuations are mitigated or reduced naturally. Um, and so let me give you an example. Um, example is that, you know, Zara's clothing company, um, they do physical hedging and they do this by buying white cloth in bulk when the price of white cloth is low in the international market and they keep it and um, they, they uh, whenever, you know, they basically uh, can dye the cloth, they choose to dye the cloth or print the cloth as and when needed, but they do uh, buy, you know, they do wait and buy in bulk in order to reduce their risk and to do hedging. And this is an example of physical hedging. Some other examples are, um, you know, companies may choose to just altogether eliminate the whole import, export, um, financial, you know, the, the whole price volatility and all of that by just manufacturing and selling in the same country. Um, also, um, sometimes companies choose to build a plant in a country where the labor rates and currencies are not expected to appreciate. So basically the idea is that companies many times choose to operate in countries that you know the currencies are very, very stable and there's not going to be a lot of price fluctuation. So these are examples of um, physical hedging. Again, these are just all methods that companies are using to reduce, um, to deal with price volatility, which really can have a huge impact on, on their costs and their profitability. Finally, another thing that companies um, sometimes do is the fixed plus variable price. So for example, um, if there is a situation where two parties want to enter a long-term contract, but the price of a key commodity of a supplier is very volatile. For example, there is, um, you want to get into a long-term contract. There are two elements. So um, basic transportation and the price of fuel. Now you, uh, you're deciding to enter a contract with let's say a shipping company and um, you talk to the shipping company and you say, look, um, we understand that there's a lot of volatility in the fuel market, but we want to enter a long-term contract with you. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll enter the long-term contract with a specified price. So that's going to be stable. That's going to be the basic transportation cost for, you know, that will lock in to, with you. And then what we'll do is as far as the fuel price goes, uh, we will pay you the fuel price, you know, as separately based on, we'll tie it to an international index that we both decide on. So if the price of fuel increases on the index, then we'll pay you a little bit more. If it goes down, we'll pay you less. So this is a way of, um, you know, uh, a sort of dividing the fixed and variable price. And this is a way to, again, reduce the risk of volatile pricing. And, um, you know, you really, many times what happens is this is beneficial because otherwise a shipping company, if the fuel price goes up, let's say a little bit, the shipping company can charge you a huge exorbitant price and that might not be a very good situation. So in order to reduce that volatility risk, um, this is another solution. Uh, where you kind of just divide the price up and you enter a contract um, that has this division. All right, uh, moving forward now, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about capital goods. Um, these are goods that are like huge investments. Just imagine big uh, machinery, for example. And, um, you know, if, if a company is buying and making this huge kind of investment could be a you know investment in buying a factory or buying some huge um, technical goods. Um, then there's a different you know, there's a whole different set of things that need to be considered. You need to consider the entire life 
cycle cost. So the cost not only of just the upfront purchase, but again, um, you know, the servicing cost, the, um, the throughout the life cycle, all the various costs, and you need to really sort of forecast them and think about them and um, include them when you're thinking about the, the, the price that is being offered by various um, suppliers. You also need to estimate the residual value, which means at the end of the life of the product, how much you will be able to sell it for. Um, you need to consider doing various product trials. Um, you need to think about whether you want to lease, hire, or buy the machinery or the capital good. And there are also certain um, financial considerations such as taxes, government subsidies, and social and environmental considerations. This on the slide is basically the lifetime cost of capital goods. And so um, here in the initially, you know, it's, you need to specify what goods, what, what's exactly what type of capital um, good that you need to buy, what, is, what it is. Um, then you need to understand the pricing. And as I mentioned, you know, um, it's not just the upfront purchase price. You need to understand the startup, the spares, uh, the cost of spares, uh, the transportation price, insurance, taxes, duties, everything. The actual purchasing is, again, quite um, complex. You need to understand the whole contract management, third-party inspection, um, facility costs, then comes down, then the next thing is to consider the installation, how, you know, and once the, the good is installed, then, you know, the inspection, the testing of the capital good, site, checking the site, giving training to your um, employees on how to use the, the equipment in the right way. Um, then finally is the operational part, which again is the maintenance, modification, the downtime, the spares, all of these, the amount of energy that's going to be consumed. And finally, the disposal of the good at the end of its life, how is it going to be done? Um, you know, the, the salvage value, how much will you be able to sell it at the end of um, the life of the product? A um, couple of things to think about when you are looking at big purchases. Um, you need to remember that um, in general, there's a rather long approval process. And once the goods are finally, it, you should, there's a, it's a, there should be a systematic process of, uh, go, of, of purchasing of large ticket items. And suppliers should definitely not be told in advance that, you know, you're going to be working with them until it's 100%, you know, you've gone through all the phases and it's, it's decided, um, uh, you know, throughout the organization, everybody's on the same page. Um, also, it's very important to factor in time for negotiation and uh, making the contract. So you definitely don't want to rush into, um, you know, the whole um, procurement process for these kind of um, items. And um, you also want to make sure that you incorporate guarantees within the contract so that if for any reason the good is not just it malfunctions, it's not working, um, you have certain guarantees in place. Next, I will be discussing uh, with you when companies should outsource and when they shouldn't. So uh, before I continue exploring this, let me just discuss what outsourcing is. So outsourcing is when you decide to buy goods or services from an outside or foreign supplier um, instead of doing it internally. So there are certain functions that companies decide that, uh, you know, functions that they want to do internally. And many times companies decide that there are certain services or certain parts um, of goods um, that they're manufacturing, let's say they are manufacturing something. Well, instead of making everything from scratch, they may decide to buy certain things from the market or outsource them. Um, similarly, uh, there may be services, uh, they may be, for example, manufacturing clothing, but they may not be interested in actually um, 
delivering the goods to customers because that may not be their expertise. And so they may decide to outsource that service, outsource their transportation. So that's the different, that's, that's just an example. These are a couple of examples to give you an idea of what outsourcing is. So now there, there are many advantages of outsourcing. Um, one of the advantages is that you reduce the fixed costs of your company and you increase your variable costs, but you definitely reduce your fixed costs. Um, you also reduce the capital investment that is required. So um, if you decide to sort of manufacture all the ingredients or all the, let's say you're a computer company and you decide to manufacture everything from scratch, all the chips, all the hardware, everything, well, that would require a huge capital investment. And so if you decide to outsource instead, um, it would reduce your capital investment. Again, if you are ready to outsource certain goods and you know buy certain parts or hardware parts, and you can spend the same amount of money or the money that you save in accelerating new product development. Now, the companies that you buy, um, let's say you're buying certain um, computer equipment from, and let's say you're a computer manufacturer, but you're buying certain hardware uh, components from a from a different supplier, um, they may have economies of scale and they may be able to offer you the same goods at a lower price point as compared to if you decided to make everything in-house. So, um, and they also may be give, being able to provide you cutting edge, new, um, you know, better quality um, sort of hardware um, that you can use in your products. And so, um, and the reason is that that, you know, maybe they have a specialty in making that hardware that you don't have. So again, um, when you're thinking about why outsourcing, well, uh, you know, external suppliers many times have better capability. They may have uh, more capacity. And uh, when you buy things from an outsource, and when you outsource certain components, that frees up some of your resources for other more higher value uh, purposes. Also, um, you may your overall operating costs may get go down when you outsource, and um, you may have lower risk because if you do everything in house, maybe you're not you you, you know you may make some mistakes. Um, because you would be operating in areas that you do not have, you know, comp, you know, your core competence isn't in those areas. You may also, um, you know, it may be a good idea to outsource because maybe you lack certain internal resources. And so you just don't have the internal resources required to make um, go all the goods in-house, all the parts in-house. Um, also, um, you, you know, the supplier that you may be buying from may have economies of a scale and that would give them, they, that would give them a better cost, lower cost advantage. And they could, you know, your overall, you would be able to buy the same part at a lower cost as compared to making everything in-house. If you do decide to, um, do outsourcing, it's very important for you to have a very good contract in place. And uh, what this basically, some of the key components that you should keep in mind um, to include in contracts that you make with your suppliers is, you know, a, a, a very detailed um, definition of the products and services that you uh, will be buying or outsourcing, sorry. Um, also, what are the audit and reporting procedures going to be? You should have the ability to add or delete services. You should um, be have volume change procedures. The service levels and KPIs should be identified. The objectives and what needs to be delivered on both sides should be outlined. How your company's, you know, key uh, information will be protected um, should be identified. Change control process should be identified. Um, it should be mentioned that, you know, your company has the right to do market benchmarking, which means to go out in the market and check, you know, your, the, 
suppliers or the company who you're outsourcing with their performance as compared to the rest of the market. In case you face any disputes, how those disputes will be resolved should be outlined. And also um, contract termination procedures should be mentioned. In order for outsourcing to be successful, it's important that you know, all the activities um, should be well-defined. The roles and responsibilities of all parties um, should be clear. There should be a good relationship with the supplier. The supplier should be offering high quality and there should be effective contract management and monitoring. Now, if you are doing out offshore outsourcing, which means outsourcing um, with a company based in a different country. Um, this again, a lot of big companies are doing outsourcing. For example, a lot of companies in the US um, just have decided to outsource a lot of their manufacturing to China. Um, this has obviously a lot of advantages, but um, there are certain problems that do come with the advantages. And those include, you know, a more complex supply chain management. Um, higher lead time so there's definitely it takes a lot longer um, for goods to reach um, when you are uh, sort of importing from a different country and there may be certain security considerations so with all the good there's definitely some bad um, and um, if you do decide to outsource um, in some respects your risk does go down but there may be, for example, if there may be some other risks that actually do increase. For example, there may be delays. If your supplier delays giving you your goods, that may uh, delay your manufacturing and you may lose certain customers. So let me give you an example of Boeing 787. And um, when Boeing actually was um, launching 787, um, they decided to outsource and buy a lot of the different parts of Boeing 787. And so they worked with all these different suppliers and they said, look, can you make each one of these parts and we'll buy them for you. And they worked with some of the best suppliers in the world, but unfortunately, and you know, Boeing went out in the market and <clears throat> sort of announced they'll be releasing this new plane and they got money up front. And so they had all these dates, everything, sort of mentioned in all of media and everything. But you know, what happened is that the companies that they were outsourcing uh, with uh, delayed the uh, giving them the goods. And so what happened is that one of actually the big, uh, very, you know, financially sound and strong um, suppliers, Rolls Royce, they delayed um, giving them the engine for uh, Boeing 787. And so there was a delay in actually the release of the airline and um, this was a big problem. It posed a very big problem for Boeing. So again, um, this is just an example of outsourcing going wrong. And um, this is something that companies should be very well aware of, the advantages and disadvantages of outsourcing. All right, next I will be discussing what purchasing social responsibility is. And uh, the big question is that, you know, should companies really be worried about this? And what exactly is procurement social responsibility? So if we really um, look at, you know, the whole global supply chain management that's happening nowadays, there's a lot more emphasis in making sure that the suppliers that companies are working with are, have, are using ethical um, policies and procedures throughout their organization. And so um, if, for example, a company uh, decides to work with a supplier and for some reason the supplier is caught in the media for doing something unethical or not having, you know, um, so doing anything unethical in, in any way um, or not taking care of their employees and let's say there's a, you know, some employees die Due to some unfortunate event, um, you know, due to some, you know, just oversight on the part of the supplier, then these kind of issues get highlighted in the media, and anybody working with such suppliers get a lot of flack or negative publicity from, um, you know, the entire world, and this can really impact a brand in a very big way. So nowadays, there is this whole. Um, 
idea of purchasing res uh, social responsibility and really being very careful with um, you know how you're doing purchasing and also mentioning this to customers and explaining to them that if they are buying a good then um, it is been procured and it has been made using you know it's a completely ethical good there's nothing um, that has been done in making the good that is unethical or that they should be worried about in general um, when you're thinking about a you know a company there are three big hurdles to success the first thing is you you know a company needs to be ahead of competition they need to make money um, so that's a big you know hurdle the next hurdle is that they need to make sure that they're complying with all the regulatory demands. The third hurdle, however, is also a very important one, which is meeting and exceeding social demands of civil, civil society. So again, um, you know, this, these are three equally important, very important hurdles. Um, you can't say that a company will be successful by, by eliminating any one of these. Um, company will need to be careful to do all three of these in, able, in, a, in order to be successful, including meeting social demands. And this whole purchasing responsibility, social responsibility falls within, you know, the whole idea of meeting social demands. So um, in general, you know, for any company, they have economic responsibilities, they have legal responsibilities, they have ethical responsibilities. Again, this means, you know, not doing anything unethical, using the right ways, and means to, um, you know, procure goods, to manufacture goods, to deliver goods. But there's also discretionary responsibilities that go above and beyond ethical responsibilities and include giving back to society. And a lot of companies are engaged in such activities um, because it gives, it really helps their brand name. And, and people feel a lot more comfortable working with uh, buying goods from, you know, companies that are giving back to society in a big way. So in terms of, you know, in a range of procurement activities, IKEA, for example, there are a lot of things that companies are doing to ensure purchasing social responsibilities. IKEA signs a code of conduct with its suppliers and basically it ensures that they're not going to be using any child labor or using any unethical means to, um, you know, make the goods that IKEA will be buying from them. Intel many times um, with their suppliers, especially suppliers that are, you know, a lot of these chips, computer chips, there's some conflict minerals um, that may be included. So they basically have a process where they go and they audit and they check their suppliers and regularly check that they don't, they are not doing anything unethical. Um, Starbucks um, also goes ahead and trains its suppliers um, in terms of, you know, there's all kinds of training, ethical practices um, and other training as well. And something that Patagonia, um, a company by the name of Patagonia does is it provides a lot of supply chain transparency. And actually what Patagonia does is it's quite impressive. So um, if you actually go uh, to Patagonia's website and Patagonia basically makes, you know, warm clothing, especially for people, um, you know, living in cold regions or doing outdoor activities such as trekking and all. Uh, people many times like to buy from this brand. And if you go and you click on uh, their footprint of a good, you can actually see all the, the um, different <clears throat> suppliers who they have worked with to make this product. So all the different uh, companies they may have outsourced from. And uh, not only that, it gives details on the fact of uh, the supplier's um, sort of uh, practices and it ensures that everything all the different parts that have gone into making this product have been procured ethically and that um, the suppliers have very good policies and procedures and are very ethical um, and so whoever is buying this product can rest assured that you know nothing illegal has been done in the manufacturing and ethical policies and procedures have been followed throughout and this gives basically a lot of supply chain transparency to the to the end purchaser so um so definitely purchasing social responsibility is something that companies 
should be aware of, and they should definitely be making sure that they um, follow policies and procedures that allow them to make, you know, do their purchasing in a very socially responsible way. way. With that, I come to an end to the purchasing um, lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I look forward to discussing with it with, it with you soon. Thank you.